everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to talk with Michelle Browder, artist, activist, and creator of the Anarcha Lucy and Betsy Monument in Montgomery, Alabama, about how we can honor the mothers of gynecology. My name is Rebecca Decker, pronouns she, her, and I'll be your host for today's episode. Before we get started, I have a quick announcement. I wanted to let you know that we are opening our evidence-based birth pro membership for a free trial this July, where you can try out all of our pro member resources for free for 30 days if you sign up between July 10 and July 17. If you want to get a notification and instructions on how to get the free trial, just go to ebbirth.com and sign up for the newsletter on our homepage. The Evidence-Based Birth Pro membership includes our PDF library, a library of all our continuing education courses, a private online community, monthly trainings, and our new doula mentorship program. The EBB Pro Membership is the primary way that we fund the work that we do here at EBB, and this is the perfect time to try it out and see if it's right for you. Again, just go to ebbirth.com, our homepage, and make sure you're on our newsletter so that you can get the invitation when it goes out on July 10. For today's episode, I want to give you a heads up that we will be discussing anti-Black racism, use of the N-word, experimentation on enslaved women, sexual trafficking and abuse, In around 40 minutes, we will mention postpartum suicidal ideation. If there are any other detailed content or trigger warnings, we'll post them in the description or show notes that go along with this episode. And now I'd like to introduce our honored guest. Today, I am so excited to welcome Michelle Browder to talk about the mothers of gynecology. Michelle Browder, pronouns she, her, is a nationally recognized artist, activist, and amplifier Bridging the Racial Divide Through Art, History, and Conversation. This artistic and straightforward daughter of Chaplain Curtis and Buena Browder was born in the beautiful snow-capped state of Denver, Colorado. Michelle attended the Art Institute of Atlanta, where she studied graphic design and visual communications. And Michelle's artwork has been exhibited in art galleries around the world, most notably the Rosa Parks Museum, located in Montgomery, Alabama. In September 2021, Michelle did something really special. She created a monument to honor three enslaved women, Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy, in Montgomery, Alabama. This monument is a reminder of the inhumane treatment and experimentation on enslaved Black bodies. The medical procedures that we have access to today in gynecology have been perfected because of them. And this monument honors these women and all those that came after them on the front end of justice. I'm so thrilled that Michelle is here. Welcome, Michelle, to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Michelle, I know you have a really fascinating story. So can you tell our listeners how you got started in your work as both being an artist and an activist? See, I don't know if I've ever like publicly told that story about how I became an artist, but I was somewhat of a a problem child because I moved to the antebellum. Well, just after integration, the Mm -hmm. South, we were my, my, you know, born in Denver, come down uh, to little Verbena, Alabama, population 1500. And I experienced a lot of racism. And this was before, you know, this was integration. So it's new, Mm -hmm. you know, newly integrated. It was really bad. Um, it was. And yeah. so this was like in the 70s. And I can, can just remember going to school and, and being called the N-word, being mm. taunted because I was tall. I was always, you know, kind of curvy. And just, you know, and my teachers would use the N-word. And it was just not a good time mm-hmm. uh, to move from a beautiful city in diversity like Denver, Colorado to the South. And so I, I found myself fighting all the time. Mm-hmm. And so I was suspended from school. That my third suspension, my father, who's the first black prison chaplain for, you know, the state of Alabama, appointed by Governor George Wallace, he said, Michelle, if you don't get a hold of your anger, if you don't find a way to creatively channel it, you are going to be in prison. He said, I'm gonna. He says, I'm awfully fearful. So he literally brought me eight tubes of paint and he bought me like 10 t-shirts and he was like find a way you can't sit here and watch Oprah Winfrey all day latchkey kids we would sit home 
and watch Oprah because, you know, our parents wouldn't get home to like four and five o'clock. My father said, find a way to channel your energy. He said, I don't want to see you. I don't want to have to come and see you at Tutwiler Prison, which is one of the worst prisons uh, for women in the state. Well, it's really the only one, but it's one of the worst in the South for women. And so I said, okay. So I, you know, literally I started painting. Fast forward, I go to the Art Institute of Atlanta, was accepted there and hit with racism again. Mm -hmm. It was a postcard that was created by Robert Tom, very famous postcard, Sims holding a speculum, enslaved girl on the table, two white doctors surrounding her and, and two enslaved girls peering behind the sheet. And I saw that at the age of 18 at the Art Institute of Atlanta. And I It was like posted asking, there as a piece of artwork? Yeah, it was on his desk. Okay. So, yeah, it was on my professor's desk. And, you know, because I was an illustrator and, you know, I, for whatever reason, he had this postcard, but it stuck with me. And I finally just, you know, worked up the courage to ask him, what is this? You know, what is this about? Can you explain it to me? And he was very dismissive. And he said, you go figure it out. So, you know, I'm coming from Alabama where Dr. King had a dream, Rosa Parks had a feet, and that was it. You know, thankfully, I had parents that were very conscious and would teach us, you know, about the African diaspora, but I didn't know this story. And so it was, you know, long story short, I went to learn about it in Atlanta. There's this place called the Shrine of the Black Madonna, and they would teach you about the African diaspora, teach you about, you know, who these enslaved people were before they were enslaved, you know, doctors and, you know, that worked with the apothecary and herbalists and and so I returned, this was over the summer break, I never will forget it. And when I went back to finish my portfolio, I wanted to honor these three girls. Mind you, I'm a kid myself, I'm just 18. Mm -hmm. And at the end of my portfolio, when I presented, my professor said, go, you know, you have to, um, he's basically, he told me that I needed to stay longer to diversify my portfolio. He said, it's too black. And it was too black because I honored these three girls that I just recently learned about. Mm -hmm. So I dropped out of school and I've been an entrepreneur ever since, but that is the beginning of my art history. Long story short. Yeah. So for our listeners who don't know Anarcha, Lucy and Betsy and you know what this picture was that you saw mm -hmm. that kind of started you on this journey, who were they? How did they resist? And why should we be centering them in mm -hmm. obstetrics and gynecology and not the doctor who was experimenting on them? We should center them because they were on breeding farms. These young ladies, these girls, they were ages 17, Anarka being 17, 16, 18, as young as nine. There were 11 of them in total. But Sims, who's lauded as being the father of modern gynecology, literally wrote in his memoir about these three, in particular, these three girls, because Anarka, 17, she had 30 surgeries. And it was a vesco vaginal fistula that was occurring, you know, from prolonged childbirth. It was the wearing down of the membranes and it would form a hole, which would incontinence. It would render them incontinent and, and basically, you know, fecal matter and sometimes, you know, urine. And, and it just wasn't a pleasant thing. They smelled, it was painful, and they really weren't fit for duty, if you will, because these were breeding farms. And Arca was 17 again when she had her first child. She was introduced to Sims at the age of 14. And so it was known you know, there was this lie that Black people did not feel pain or that Black women had a higher tolerance. So you could actually do what you wanted to with them surgically. And it's, you know, that was a way to dismiss their humanity. So mm -hmm. Sims, this very popular illustration, and you've seen it, you probably just never really paid any, any attention to it. But Robert Tom was commissioned by Park Davis which is now Pfizer, to create 45 great moments in medicine. And when he created the story or the illustration that is now known throughout the world of these three girls, he just basically had these three white men surrounding them. And, you know, that it was customary for especially with these experimentations that you would invite your colleagues in to watch the procedures 
And so that's the postcard that I saw. That was the illustration that has kind of been ingrained in the minds of people when it comes to modern gynecology. So once I moved to Montgomery, Alabama, I started giving tours and lo and behold, this man that I learned about at the age of 18 is standing at our state's capital. It was erected by MASA, the Medical Association for the State of Alabama, and it's to honor J. Marion Sims. And on the outside of this statue, it says that he is the father of modern gynecology. And I said, well, geez, if he's the father, where are the mothers? And it's not the princess of Eugenie you know, from France, uh, because that's who they tout that he cured. But it was these 11 enslaved African girls that were sexually trafficked on breeding farms and basically used to replenish the stock to bear children. They were very much high on the enslavement list, if you will, or the commodity. You know, these right. they were property. They weren't even viewed as people. They were quote unquote valuable property. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to think that they were just babies, they were girls, Mm -hmm. you know, and I I wanted to bring their story to life, you know, and I was triggered. So in 2000, I was triggered. And then during COVID, I said, it's either now or never, you know, so Mm -hmm. 2020, I started rethinking the designs. I brought in a couple of collaborators, um, some fabricators that could help me bring my vision to life. And here we are three years later. Mm-hmm. But it's important for people to know about these girls because, the, you know, they've been erased. The erasure of mm-hmm. this history is very prominent, but I want to bring it to life. And some of the surgical instruments that we now use, some of the positions, the Sims position, the mm-hmm. Sims retractor, you know, the speculum, a lot of these, inter- these instruments are named in honor of Sims when in actuality it was the mutilation and the experimentation on Black girls, Black bodies that really catapulted him to where he is in history today. Yeah. And one of the things I've learned from you and the speakers you gather and the historians is that Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy were not just passive recipients of Mm -hmm. this experimentation, but they're responsible for the advances. Can you explain to our listeners like why we should not be attributing the speculum and things like that to Sims, but to the mothers? Yeah. So Sims had a lot of his, a lot of the doctors started, you know, really going after him. They started rebutting a lot of the things that he said. It was a little controversial there because, you know, the abuse that these girls suffered, he started to lose a lot of his friends and a lot of his colleagues began to step away. Because they couldn't even bear watching what he was doing. You know, and there was also rumors that he had bothered some of the girls on the plantation. They were mulatto. He owned enslaved girls himself. Mm -hmm. And so they started, you know, waning. There's a couple, as a matter of fact, J.C. Hallman talks a lot about some of the the doctors that were working with him that rebutted uh, some of the things that he was saying. But uh, basically, the girls were left to perfect these surgeries themselves they would have to then hold themselves down, you know, each other down as Sims would experiment on them. Mm -hmm. And Lucy went on to, I'm sorry, Anarcha uh, went on to be leased out as a nurse, literally a half block Mm -hmm. from where the backyard hospital, the Negro hospital is located at the Montgomery. It was, it was a hotel where people would come in and, and oftentimes they would come in sick and Sims would lease her out to them as a nurse Uh, to care for them. So they began to care for each other because, I mean, what else are you going to do? They they had to, you know, take care of one another. And in that, they actually perfected a lot of the procedures that we know today, but he Mm -hmm. took credit for it. You know, they would go in. Yeah. So it's just interesting how a person, an individual, a human could be deemed as, you know, incompetent, but yet have the intellect to perfect these procedures. Yeah, they became very skilled in the operating room and in the Mm post-operative area where they were caring for each other. And I think that's, you know, important for us to remember there, that was a form of resistance for them. Absolutely. They were doulas. They were midwives. You know, Mm -hmm. they were 
these healthcare practitioners that we don't talk about. But yeah, it is an act of resistance. The mere fact that they lived through this could have mm-hmm. killed themselves, you know, would have been easy. But for three and a half years, they continued on mm-hmm. to live through this chaos. There's two pieces of artwork, of your artwork, that stick out at me when I think about Anarcho Lucy and Betsy. And I was wondering if you could first describe the painting for us, because that was the first your introduction to this topic and you reimagined what that scene looked like. Can you talk about that? Oh, Rebecca, I had to challenge, (laughs) I had to challenge this propaganda because when you look at Sims holding the speculum, his arms are, you know, folded. And then there's this look on Anarcha's face or Lucy, there's a conflict between whether it's Anarcha or Lucy, but just the look, She's very fearful. She's afraid of what's going to happen to her. Kind of meek and passive and just sitting there ready to be experimented on. Grasping her pearls. And the other two peering behind the sheet. But you can see the fear. So I said, well, let's push the envelope. Let's flip the script. Let's put Sims in that position. Let's and bring it into where we are today in 20, you know, in the 21st century. Let's have the girls then represent the girls that we see today with the wife beaters, you know, and the jeans and the waist beads and have bring them in the 21st century. And that's what I did. Only had about a week to finish this project. So I brought in a young lady, you know, two very wonderful, not fabricators, but artists to come in to help me get it finished because the painting is very big. It was supposed to go on the outside of the building, but Mm. I decided not to do that for the fear that there would be some backlash. So it will go on the inside of this building that I will share with you later Mm -hmm. about. Uh, But basically, yeah, it's to challenge and to flip the narrative Mm -hmm. and to change it. And if you look in their eyes, you have the mothers of gynecology in teenage form. But when you look at them, they don't have the anger, the bitterness, the hatred that these other uh, doctors and these um, men that created these Hmm. atrocities against their bodies, they don't have that in them. And so it's a very interesting piece. And if you want to see it, it's on our website. Yeah, we'll link to that in the show notes. You can also find it at anarchalucybetsy.org and Betsy is spelled B-E-T-S-E-Y. And if you scroll down, you'll see the painting. And I just have to say, you know, I when I was at your conference, I took a few pictures. I sent it to some of my friends and they were just blown away. And I love how you have it on the side of a, a truck that makes like the yes. backdrop for your, comp- yeah. for your concerts. And mm-hmm. it was, you know, it's really inspiring. You'll have to go look at, you can Google to find the old picture and then look at the new one. And it's definitely a flipping of the script. And I have to shout out to my team to Rachel Wolfback and Zoe Boston out in the Bay area that came in that was like, look, what, what do you want? How, how are we going to do this? And we got it done. Like literally, um, they stayed with me three days and then I, I finished it up, but it was, yeah, we have to challenge this narrative and Mm -hmm. art is a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the other major piece you did to honor the mothers. Oh, the other major piece, (laughs) it is a 15 foot statue of these three girls and Arca Lucy, Betsy, Lucy having 12 surgeries nearly died. And this is by the enslaver and Sims account in his memoir that he talks about how Lucy nearly lost her life, uh, that he was fearful that she was going to die. But it's an Arca Lucy and Betsy, and it's it's centered in prayer and with Anarcha, with her head back, her hair is in braids because I wanted her to be in a prayerful state, but also show that this was a child. This was just, you know, a girl. And each one of them has distinctive hairstyles that's relatable to Black culture and Black women. And so Betsy has cornrows and Lucy has these bantu knots straight out of the African culture. And each one of them, they're adorned with beautiful necklaces and earrings and just beautifully done. And it's made out of metal, some brass, but discarded items. And when I say discarded, there's beauty in the broken. Some of these pieces are very beautiful, but they were tossed away. So like the glass that's around the necklace of Lucy that symbolizes the Maasai tribe and the beauty and the culture uh, that's in Africa and in some of these countries. And 
what can I say? It's beautifully done. And I had a team of 15 Burning Man artists that came in to volunteer. I flew out to San Francisco to learn how to weld by the amazing Dana Albany. And she (laughs) took me under her wing and it was a fast course in learning how to weld. But to take my designs from 32 years ago to rework them and then to have it come to life was amazing. Literally, when I came back from San Francisco, I had half a head of Antarctica and a half pair of legs. And then I had skeletons in 12 different boxes. And I just had to figure it out. And thankfully, I had mother friends of mine that came from Missouri uh, to help me put the skin on the mothers. And then that took about two weeks. And then after that, I had a clean palette where I could just go in and decorate and create these beautiful, massive 15, 12, and nine feet tall structures to honor Mm -hmm. enslaved girls and women. Mm -hmm. They're definitely larger than life. And it's like you walk into your garden park that you've Mm -hmm. created for the memorial and it's very sacred feeling. And then you walk up to them and you look up and not only are they large, but then there's so much detail I yeah. could just sit there for hours and look at all the details. Can you talk about some more of the little details that you put on their bodies? Sure. sure. Well, you know, I would go to these junkyards or these scrap yards. And I remember one of them is like directly across the street from my studio. And I said, Hey, I said, I need, I'm out of metal. You know, do you have anything? I need a lot of this one item. And he's like, aren't you doing the Mothers of Gynecology? And I said, yeah. He was like, I have something for you. I've been saving it. I was gone. I was in San Francisco. So they did a big thing while I was gone here. They were scissors and sutures and retractors and speculums and everything that I needed to tell the story of these girls and the instruments that came out. So I have the Sims retractor. I have the speculum. And so it's, you know, moments like that where I would go to the scrapyard, I went to thrift stores <laughs> to find some of these pieces. And then when folks found out that I was coming or that I would be traveling to San Francisco, we stopped in in Los Angeles. They were like, hey, we're going to have a metal razor for you. So people brought in candle operas and chandeliers and somebody even brought a muffler. And as a matter of fact, it was so funny. The woman who actually donated the muffler came to this year's conference (laughs) to see them. And she was a part of that. So it was amazing. So there's beautiful, I know there's a a couple of special pieces. Uh, There's a hand around Betsy's pregnant belly. Mm -hmm. And that woman, her mother, she brought her mother to Montgomery and we toured together. I gave them a tour and she became a friend and her mother passed away. And her mother said to her, I want you to give these items to Michelle. I know that she can do something with it. And this was before, you know, I started working on the Mothers of Gynecology. Mm -hmm. So they're all very precious pieces. Mm -hmm. There's drawer handles. And then there's Adinkra symbols, which are symbols, Ghanaian languages, Goddess Supreme, which is Anarcha symbol. And then Lucy symbol is friendship because they formed a friendship together, the tongue and teeth. And then Betsy's would be strength because it takes a lot of strength to go through what they went through and then to live to talk mm-hmm. about it. Anarcha has kind of like an empty space. Can you describe mm-hmm. what that means and what that symbolizes? Yeah. So initially there's a fourth piece and that fourth piece, which is the fistula, and it represents the torture and the poking and prodding and the numerous numbers of experimentation, but also the torture that they must have experienced. And initially it was supposed to go inside that cavity, but I said, no, let's have it to stand alone so that it will leave a hole. And that's exactly what it it represents, the fistula, the Mm -hmm. hole that they suffered from. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, I encourage everyone, if you can get the chance someday to visit the monument in Montgomery and tour it, you can also go to the website and see pictures and and videos. And it's just an incredible contribution, Michelle. What have been some of the reactions of support since you unveiled the monument? Mm -hmm. People have been very supportive. I will say that I've also had my Pushback. I had some doctors to come Hmm. as far as UAB come and say, well, I'm diminishing his legacy that Sims was just a man of his time. I've had authors to send me books 
to kind of, you know, double down on the history of Sims and his work and to, you know, continue to glorify what he's done with these women. But for the most part, in terms of financial support and people wanting just to amplify the voice, such as yourself, you came to our conference, you know, just wanting to be a part of this movement has been amazing. I can't Mm -hmm. take anything for it. So we've been receiving some grant funding, you know, and none other than MASA came. Really? (laughs) Yes, they did. They came and they donated like $25,000 and pledged to do more. You know, it's not just about the money, but it's like, can we remove Sims from the state's capital? You erected him in 1939. Mm-hmm. Is there a way that we can remove him and put him in the space? I Like, I would like to have him in the space so that we can start telling that narrative. And, you know, oh. yeah. Yeah. So that's the next step. We want to have him removed from the state's capital. Mm -hmm. and placed at the site where he actually experimented on these girls. Mm -hmm. And there was a similar movement to remove him from a park in New York City, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they were successful. Yeah. They were successful. Um, But I just think it's important. So I'm not a, I don't advocate for total erasure of the history. Like, you know, they wanted to put their Sims in a graveyard. I want to put them in context, right? So, Okay. Bring him to the mother's clinic mm-hmm. and sink him in the floor. And let's have that conversation around that. I think that is where he should be. Mm-hmm. Along with the painting, along with the, we're in talks now with the, the University of Michigan to see if we could get them to donate that painting or and or on loan. You know, there's 45 uh-huh. pieces that Robert Tom created in this one of Sims. We're hoping that we can, you know, get and that, that one's in well. Michigan right now. It's in Michigan. Yeah. So write still write letters. Yeah. I think one of the things that always amazes me about you, Michelle, is you think big. Like you're mm-hmm. not a small thinker. You're a big thinker. And I'm like, I would never imagine to just be like, I want that statue. I want that painting. It's gonna go on our yes. campus. Can you tell our listeners about your campus? Cause I was just blown away by what you've created in Montgomery. Yeah. So I'm writing the coattail of my father, the first black prison chaplain, my mother, who was opened up a home for veteran women, homeless veteran women. They're in their 80s and they're like, ah, we feel like we're finished, that, you know, our mission is done. Do you have a vision for the space? And I said, absolutely, I do. And so they said, we'll do it. And so they're turning so this was over your the family's property. land. On mm-hmm. the edge of downtown. Land, and, you know, the office, the yellow building there. And if you go online, it's there too. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to turn that into an extension to tell more of the story about Black joy and how Black people were able to thrive during the reign of terror mm-hmm. and still have children and still love and still play pool and still get their hair cut and, you know, and still find mm-hmm. human spaces. And so on the back side, there's a 38 bed, excuse me, 32 bed facility uh, that we're hoping to use for students. To, so that they can come down first year medical students or traveling doulas or nurses or midwives or just folks who want to learn this history, students in particular, and particularly to learn this history so that we won't be doomed to repeat it. But it's a half acre space right in downtown Montgomery, literally mm-hmm. a half block from the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Mm-hmm. And it's walking distance within that space, walking distance from Rosa Parks Museum the Rosa Parks Museum, walking distance from the Freedom Rides Museum. So Mm -hmm. it's really, you know, the juxtaposition between all of this history has just been amazing. And literally it's eight blocks from the plantation where Anarcha was enslaved. Mm -hmm. And then four blocks from where J. Marion Sims held him in the backyard of his hospital. So the campus is basically, we're curating it so that it can be a healing space. You know, there's an apothecary. We want to introduce holistic medicines, not that anything's wrong with, but I just believe in using the earth to heal. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a healing space. So, you know, people are coming even now, like this week, I have several meetings with people. They're going to eat at the site. They're going to have their breakout sessions and talk more candidly about how they can change this narrative of racism in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's that type of space. It's a healing space, but also um, a space to learn about this history and what we must do to change the narrative. One of the things that was really special 
was the annual day of reckoning conference that you created. Mm -hmm. And, and in 2022, it was your second annual event. And I loved how you're right. Everything is within walking distance, you know, Mm -hmm. the bus stop where Rosa Parks made her, her sitting, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, and the national Memorial for peace and justice, which is an incredible experience. And it's, you know, right. Like you said, just a couple of blocks away from what, you're doing. And then at the conference or the day of reckoning that you held, you walked us down the street. So I loved how you moved the attendees around. So we never just stuck in one spot, but we were visiting different places together. Can you tell our listeners about that space that's in the middle of downtown Mm -hmm. and what it is and what it's going to be or what it is turning into? Rebecca. Because this is one of my favorite stories of yours. Yeah. Okay. I, I get excited when I think about it because you would this is like a fairy tale. You it would is. not believe and the magnitude of it. So 2021, February 28th of 21, normally I, I organize this event called Art on the Square. I own the event and it's for artists to come out, display their work. And because of COVID, we couldn't do that. So I said, hey, why don't we just create pieces of art? honoring Black women, Black mothers, granny wives, midwives, whatever. And let's adorn the actual square, which is where Black people were bought, sold, and traded Mm -hmm. alongside cattle. I said, let's make it an art gallery, an outdoor art gallery, but it shows these women. And so we did that. And we had about maybe 25 art installations and I said, okay, so, you know, what's, we had about a hundred people that showed up and um, I said, let's, I want to take you all on a journey. I want to take you to a space that has not been largely talked, spoken about in Montgomery, Alabama and or in the history. And I said, this is where black women were tortured, literally. So I, we walk half block to the backyard of J. Marion Sims's office. When we hit that corner, people started weeping. Just, I mean, it was just like, they started to cry. And I started to, you know, the energy was so high that day. And so I literally took them to the front door of um, a building that's on the site. It was erected in 1862. Uh, It's where the first open heart surgery took place or the sutures um, that took place there. And in the backyard of that building is where Anarcha Lucy Betsy and those nine other women were held captive. And we laid flowers and I told the story and there was a poem and there was a song that was February 28th of 21. Mm-hmm. The following year, I purchased the building and the site. February 15th of 22, I closed. And then fast forward, February 28th and Arca Lucy Betsy Day is when we had our conference. One year. Wow. And so we own the space. I own it. And now we're going to tell the story that we want to tell the truth about a modern gynecology and the women that help shape it. Mm-hmm. And what is, and what is it going to be? Can you talk a little bit? It's going to be a space for doulas, midwives, obstetrics, and gynecologists to come in, have conversation. It's a museum so that people can learn, you know, while you're upstairs, you can get your checkups, but downstairs you can learn about the history. And then in the back part of the museum, there's a doula there. There's a midwife that can, you know, offer services and resources to women who can't afford it. Mm -hmm. We don't want them to have to pay for what we want to offer them, which is just, you know, some dignity and some respect in this pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But then in that, in that same vain. I want them to learn about this history and learn about our bodies and what we've contributed to healthcare and science. And so the space will be a healing space, but upstairs will be the space for the obstetrics and gynecologists to come in, first year medical students, learn about the history, learn how to administer dignity and respect Mm -hmm. and just teaching them this history because once you know the history you can't help but to administer Mm -hmm. respect and dignity in in this humanity so that's that's the space it's going to be the mothers of gynecology health and wellness clinic and i'm excited taking place on the same ground and location where anarcha lucy and betsy did their work absolutely yeah absolutely pretty incredible 
It is. <laughs> I did want to talk about the mobile unit, though. Yes. Because, you okay. know, I saw you post about that the other day. If you don't follow Michelle on Instagram, you have to. Um, it's very inspiring. And I saw you. So tell us about the mobile clinic. What is this? What is this in response to? We can't wait. They're closing rural hospitals. And I think there's a, an act of the mommy bus or the American Rescue Plan, you know. In Congress, they, they're trying to yeah, pass. Yeah. They administer funds, or I believe they started administering some funds in October 21, or, or that was the deadline of the grant. So we missed that, mm-hmm. right? So what are we going to do when these women in 37 counties in the state of Alabama cannot get the care that they need? Right. Or they may not have the insurance that they need. These are rural counties. They're closing these rural hospitals. So I was like, we can't wait. And I can't wait for some big organization to say, "Okay, Michelle, we're going to write you a check. There's a lot that goes on when you're fundraising, as you should know. And so I said, well, we can't wait. (laughs) Right. We got to do something right now. So I have a doula on staff. I have a midwife on staff. And then we have the blessings from Dr. Joya Perry, who came for our Mother's Day event. And I unveiled a beautiful camper, just hitch it up to a truck and ride out to these 37 rural counties. It's just not that easy. We do have a team that's connecting us with women who could use the resources. Um, And so we're going to go to where they are and offer, you know, just some relief. If they need to an assessment, we will assess them. The doula will assess them. And then we will offer the opportunity for them to see a gynecologist and or a midwife any one of the two. And we're hoping to take Dr. Stephanie Mitchell out with us. And she's like, I want to go. We need to go see my patients. And so, but it's a beautiful camper. It's already, you know, I was looking at uh, purchasing a mobile unit anyway, a medical Mm -hmm. mobile unit. And I thought it's 131,000. Now, why would I spend that kind of money? But I can put that inside the building, right? And create the space or use that uh, for some of that 10.5 million that the whole project is worth. So I'm driving to an appointment in Huntsville and I saw these beautiful campers. And I'm like, how come you just can't take a camper and turn it into a, a pod, a wellness pod? It has a bathroom, it has a sink, it has everything that you need. And so I pulled over and I was like, how much is it? And I said, okay, I'm going to take my savings and do it. And that's what I did with that Arca Lucy and Betsy. I took my savings because I believe that if you build it, they will come. And so I purchased it. We outfitted it, you know, with our African beautiful stuff. And it's all stocked with all types of items that you will need to assess these women. And we're going to be leaving out. We were going to do it at the end of June, but we're going to wait until the middle of July. Mm -hmm. And we're going to hit these rural counties and touch as many women, pregnant women, birthing people as we can. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. The whole, we can't wait. We can't. We can't. Mm -mm. can't wait at all so people are dying from the lack of health care and now there's these you know the maternal health care deserts is what's getting me but then now they're finding out that it's the heart disease that you know women are Mm -hmm. you know heart disease and diabetes and we're going to cook for you we're going to bring resources we're going to bring pampers if you need to just drop your child off Let's go get a break, a mental break, whatever it is that we need to do to help these women and birthing people. We're going to do that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Food is something that came up a lot at your conference, which I, you know, I didn't think about before, but you were really opening our eyes. You had guests and speakers there talking about the importance of food and cooking and feeding people during pregnancy Mm -hmm. and postpartum and parenthood. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Chemical imbalances, you know, Mm -hmm. when you're pregnant, it's like, and then after the suicide rate, you know, after you have this beautiful bundle of joy, then what, you know, your postpartum, it's just, we have to do something. So I just feel like, you know, being a creative, I'm not a practitioner, you know, I'm not a lawyer or, you know, I'm not a doula, but I am a creative. And I think that if we create the pathways for people to be healed, Mm -hmm. then that's what I feel that I can do. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, you describe yourself as an artist and an activist and you're not involved in birth work, but I see what you're doing as part of 
birth work, mm-hmm. you know, it's that creating the spaces and the safety and the dignity and respect. Anybody can help with that. You don't have to yes. have training as a healthcare provider. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk to us about anything else you want us to know about? There's a conference coming next year. <laughs> We're going to Mobile. That's where a lot of the midwifery history is located and Mobile is so excited to have us, but we're going to, we're going to February 27th through March 1st, we'll be in Montgomery for the 27th and the 28th. And then the next day we're going to take a day trip to Mobile, Alabama, Mm -hmm. where the midwifery history, the Africa town, the Cotilda, Africa town is, you know, where those 110 enslaved folks actually built a city called Africa Town, And then the last slave ship, the Cotilda, was there. But only Lee Logan. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She was a midwife. She was one of the last midwives that practiced midwifery in the state of Alabama in 1976. So her children, a lot of the children that she caught are going to meet us, you know, and we're going to have just a beautiful moment there. Learn of the history in Mobile, how it's connected to this medical history. They have a a medical history there that no one has really talked about has no one talked. They haven't talked about it largely in part because it's, you know, it's the best kept secret. And so, and then we're going to incorporate a little art, but what I love the most is that Dr. Sharon Malone will be our keynote and she's from Mobile and she's the sister of Vivian Malone that ended, uh, that stood in the doorway at the university of Alabama that challenged George Wallace. And she's an OBGYN, Dr. Sharon Malone. And she's married to Eric Holder. <laughs> so she's going to, in our theme next year, is chart the course to maternal health, reproductive justice, and one other, I can't remember what the other one is, but we're going to chart the course. And so we're going to literally go to uh, Mobile, Alabama, and she's going to talk about her, you know, how she was able to move from Little Mobile to Washington, D.C. and help her husband and shape some of these laws and be this amazing OBGYN that she is today. And we're going to talk about menopause because you know what I've learned, and I don't know if you learned this too, during the conference, how those of us who are offering this love and support, the healers need healing. Did you not mm-hmm. feel that? I did. Well, in your event, is it unlike anything I've ever been to? And I, I came back and like told our team at EBB, I was like, I don't think I ever want to have a conference again. I just want to go to Michelle's every year. So oh. I'm planning on being there and I hope to bring more people with me. But there was singing and dancing and love and food and celebration and mourning. And it was just, there was so much life. And then yeah. you moved us from place to place. And, you know, you need that kind of, you know, it's refreshing rather than just sitting in a cold conference room all day. And Mm -hmm. you took us outdoors and you took us to different places. So I love that Mm -hmm. you're just getting everybody on buses and trolleys and taking them down to Mobile and having like a field trip during a conference, essentially. It's it's incredible. It is very healing. I came back, you know, and so did Allie, who came with me from EBB. We just felt so refreshed and inspired Mm. by being around what you created. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to get next. I'm really excited about next year. (laughs) Really excited. And Um, February is a beautiful time to go to Alabama. It's uh it's gorgeous. The tulips are in bloom. You know, it's just Mm -hmm. like springtime. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And then, you know what? And then I think like several days later, it got cold. It was really cold. Was it? Okay. It was great. We had a week of sunshine. It was like the universe. Thank you. But yeah, it's going to be amazing. So if they want information on that, you can go to the website as well. The actual link to start booking, will it will go live. It will be already live by the time your interview comes out. And I think judging by the capacity at the 2022 event, it was pretty much sold out, right? By it the, I think was. you had to shut down ticket sales. So I did. don't mm-hmm. wait. And hopefully I'll see some of our listeners there as well, who will find out about it from this discussion. Yeah. I'd love to see you there. 
Thank you. Well, and it's a little hefty. Well, but I don't. I won't say that it's hefty, but because of the traveling, some of the surprises that we have, it's a little bit more than what it was this year. But trust and believe, it's well worth it, and you have plenty of enough time from June to the end of the year, beginning of January. They'll have time to put those coins away. <laughs> And just let's let's go. I know you feed us. You know we had a concert and a dance, and you know, yeah. like I and said, Nicole Hannah Jones excursions. Yeah, Nicole Hannah Jones. <laughs> it was just about the most amazing event I've ever attended. So thank you. you know, thank you so much. It's sometimes you worry people who are artistic aren't necessarily always have the gift of logistics and you know getting things. Done. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I have no, no. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, you got it done, and you surrounded yourself. There was an amazing team supporting everything that you did. Yes, from you know the trolley driver to the person, you know, the speakers were ready, and it was it was so amazing how there was this beautiful team of people who were making it go so smoothly, and and I love that you're including info about perimenopause and menopause in next year's event. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely so Dr. Sharon Malone will bring that that history to life mm. for us. Yeah. Well, Michelle, it's been so such an honor having you on the podcast. We've wanted to interview you for a really long time, and I'm glad it worked out because Absolutely. I just really want our listeners to learn about the work that you're doing and, and to follow you. Is there, other than the website, what's the best place for people to follow your work? Uh, they can go to Instagram. Okay. It's Anarcha Lucy Betsy on Instagram and or there's Twitter, Mothers of Gyno, G Y N O. Mm-hmm. And uh, or email us, you know, sign up for the newsletter and we'll keep you posted. An action item for any students listening. I think it's really important that we change the narrative that's being taught in medical schools, nursing schools, mm-hmm. midwifery schools. Like if you're professors and faculty don't know about the mothers of gynecology, start sending them the information. And there was a book just published called Say Anarcha by one of the speakers at your conference that is also really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he has a YouTube, he has a YouTube channel too. And they're like little four minute segments. And he's talking about, you know, just how he found Anarcha. He takes you from the beginning, how her name was changed. And so he's done a lot to really amplify her voice. And so it comes out, his book is coming out soon, June mm-hmm. 6th or, but definitely check him out. JC Holm and say Anarcha. And then, Very good piece. yeah. And then medical bondage by Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens, who is also Cooper at your Owens. event and yeah. check out that book. And Linda <laughs> Villarosa. Under the Skin, mm-hmm. New York Times journalist. And that was also uh, she's covered up for in that book. Surprise now. And yeah, and Dolan Perkins, who wrote Take My Hand, about the sisters. Mm-hmm. It was fiction, but it was about the, the sisters, uh, the real sisters, that pretty much, you know, informed consent is why we have it now. It's because of them. Yeah. So, yeah. And the Ralph sisters were at your event as well. So it really was mm-hmm. like a... Who's who of people doing incredible work and I'm really excited to see what what you have planned for next year. And I know, like you said, there will be surprises. So Oh yes, fun plenty of those. Plenty <laughs> of those. All right, Michelle, thank you so much for joining us and we really appreciate you and honor your work and we also honor the mothers and thank you for all you're doing to bring attention to them. No, first of all, let me thank you <laughs> because of what you're doing to be an ally and how you're exposing racism in healthcare. And, you know, I read your article and it was just fantastic. And so I'm using some of the talking points. It's just fantastic. So make sure you follow with the work that you're doing. Thank you. Because yeah, you know, well, Hotu Ali was, you know, the lead author on that article. And, and we were grateful to your help too in supplying some of the contact info and info for the section about the work you're doing in Alabama and anyone can go to evidencebasedbirth.com slash anti-racism to get that and some of the free handouts. And that reminds me, I want to make sure you have all the PDFs. So I'll make sure you have everything you need to use when you're educating the people who come to visit the more up camp- campus. So thank you so much. Yeah. And when they asked me, when they said, well, what can we do? 
uh, go to Evidence Based Birth. Look at because you even give them some some tools as to what to do, like you know how to be an ally. And, yeah. absolutely. So thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, and thank you for having me.